Welcome to this podcast. My name is Paul and Peter in Scotland. Very pleased to be here. My email is in the description as always. I do so trust my listeners are well, uh, enjoying mercy and grace and loving kindness under the blood in the spirit, staying strong in the scripture. So we are in the glorious book of Zechariah in chapter two today. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful thing to look at uh, the uh, connection between the prophets and the things mentioned. And once again, we see here uh, with Zechariah, who was a post-captivity prophet, that is to say, when the Jews uh, were re-establishing a certain level of autonomy in Israel after the Babylon captivity around 70 years. Um, and he came right after Ezekiel and Daniel and Obadiah. Um, and so, once again, the order of the books in the Bibles that most of us use is not the exact chronological order, that is to say, in order of, uh, that they were actually written. Um, what we're attempting to do is go through all the prophets in order, and Zechariah is, is the next one after the wonderful book of Ezekiel that we've just completed. And in front of us is Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, and Malachi, not in that order. I think it's Malachi next, and then Ezra, then Nehemiah. Uh, and, of course, they look at the rebuilding of the temple. Um, so there's some very precious things in front of us, friends. Um, so let's get straight to it. Zechariah chapter 2. And I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, Whither goest thou? And he said to me, To me, as you are Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went forth to meet him, and said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. And I saith, Jehovah, well, I will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, from the land of the north, says Jehovah, for I have scattered you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, says Jehovah. Ho, oh, escape, Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says Jehovah, Sivaot, after the glory, hath he sent me unto the nations that made you a spoil. For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall become a spoil to those that serve them. And you shall know that your vase of ought hath sent me. Sing aloud and rejoice, daughter of Zion, for behold, I cometh, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, says your vase. And many nations shall join themselves to Yehovah in that day and shall be unto me for a peoples. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that Yehovah Sevaot hath sent me unto thee. So the theme of measuring and um, in Ezekiel, we saw that the Lord Jesus had a measuring line in one hand, uh, a reed with which he was uh, measuring the temple, and great precision and definition was given in those chapters. We see in the book of Revelation, we see that John uh, is told to measure uh, the temple, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the altar, that is to say, atonement, redemption, the finished work of Christ Jesus, uh, and to measure the people in the temple, which is individual Christians, I suppose looked at collectively and individually. Uh, and that's quite an important part of Scripture uh, in Revelation. We did look at it 
the other week in one of the broadcasts. Um, let's see if we can just find it quickly, friends. Um, yes. So it has to do with the... Uh, well, as we as we saw in Ezekiel with the... Um, the heave offering, which is also the, the sufferings, the atonement, the finished work of Christ, we saw that the divine estimation uh, was different to the human estimation and was slightly different to the estimation of the priests who were a type of godly Christians. Um, so there's three estimations of the finished work of Christ, that of ordinary human beings, uh, that of the faithful followers of Christ, and that of Elohim, of our God. There it is, friends. Revelation 11. Let's take a quick look at that. <laughs> or maybe not a quick look, friends. We will take a look at that when the tablet catches up. Um, so the, these are the deep waters of, of revelation knowledge to look into these things to, to be concerned about the things that God has revealed to us about holiness and righteousness um, and truth so we see here in Revelation 11 that John is given a read like a staff and told to rise and measure the temple of God the altar and those that worship in it. That's Revelation 1, 1, 1. So the temple of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. The altar is the finished work of eternal redemption, <clears throat> the holy sufferings, uh, salvation, reconciliation, all the wonderful, wonderful things that Christ Jesus did 2,000 years ago uh, in his atoning death and triumphal resurrection. And also those that worship in it. It's a, it's a rather unique portion of scripture. Indeed, the, the nearest thing I would liken it to is, as I've said in uh, Ezekiel, um, we, we did a, a wonderful uh, look at Ezekiel somewhere in the, uh, the 40s, the, the heave offering. Um, Ezekiel. Forty-five mentions the heave offering, and we we saw that there was different um, estimations and quantifications of, of the finished work of Christ. Here it is. Yes. Yes. So, so, so you can go and listen to Ezekiel 45 to learn more about that. And I would liken that to Revelation um, 11 here, where we see uh, measuring the temple of God. So it's a very precious thing to think of, really, in Revelation 11, uh, to, to know that God gave the Lord Jesus Christ his revelation to give to mankind um, through John the Apostle. And John is commanded to measure the temple of God, which is Christ Jesus, you see. Um, and, of course, we know that John, uniquely laid in the physical bosom of Jesus, is the only disciple in Scripture of which we are told that. Um, and, of course, John's gospel is unique among the gospels. It's the divine side, the secret side. There's very little failure in John's gospel. Uh, there's very little death. There's very little mention of the devil. Uh, it begins straight away in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, everything was made through him, nothing that was made uh, was not made except through him, everything came through Christ, for Christ, with Christ and by Christ. And Christ is a very life in every human that's born into the world, that eternal life that was with the Father, we read in one of the wonderful three epistles of John the Apostle, 1, 2, 3 John, which precede the eight books of Revelation. Uh, I say because obviously it contains the seven epistles to the seven churches. So Revelation is actually a book of eight books. 
So Revelation 1, 1, 1, it's very precious to think that at the beginning of this wonderful book, uh, John the Apostle falls at the feet as dead in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus says, fear not, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Christ has the key of David who opens a door, and no one can shut it and shuts the door and nobody can open it. Well, in this chapter here, uh, John is commanded to measure the temple of God and the altar and the human beings that worship in it. Very precious thing to think of <clears throat> that John, an individual Christian disciple, is to have an estimation uh, of fellow worshippers. So... We will come back to Zechariah chapter 2, friends. So Ezekiel here sees a man with a measuring line. And Ezekiel says to the man, where are you going? Of course, this man is the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus says, to measure Jerusalem, to see the breadth of it and the length of it. So that is to say, to have an estimation of God's sovereignty, uh, God's dealings, uh, the value of Jerusalem, the value of mankind. Uh, the mountain of the daughter of Jerusalem, I would deeply commend the podcast on Isaiah 16 to your friends. It's a glorious chapter of scripture where the lamb is sent uh, to, to, the, to the ruler of the world from the rock, which is Elohim Yavar, to the ruler of the world, to the mountain of the daughter of Zion, which is descriptive of God's great concern and thoughts towards all mankind, the value of mankind, the preciousness of creation. Um, and when we read here of measuring Jerusalem, that's what's in view, God's great thoughts, God's great counsels, and God's great purposes. So what's of note here is, of course, that uh, Ezekiel is entering into the estimation of Christ Jesus, uh, of God's work, of God's sovereignty and God's dealings with mankind. And, and of course, we see here that there is something of a restoration for the Jewish nation at this time. Uh, we're now in a, around uh, um, BC 550. So this is uh, 2,500, coming up 2,600 years ago that we're reading of here, friends. And, uh, this was at the end of the Babylonish captivity. So it's as much as to say that uh, the great prophet Zechariah is, is being shown uh, that God still has holy affection and holy love and holy mercy towards, uh, towards the Jews, towards the Jewish nation, uh, towards Jerusalem and Judah. Uh, and of course, this chapter is definitely millennial in character very, very much. Uh, we saw in chapter one, uh, very powerful, we, we recorded a one hour, 11 minute podcast, friends, on Revelation one, um, very much millennial in character <clears throat> in terms of God's great thoughts of the completion of all things, the uh, the fulfillment of everything. Very precious thing to, to look into. Of course, there are many chapters in scripture that are holistic in terms of being self-contained. The, you have the, the Lord Jesus in there, you have redemption, um, um, you, you have holiness, you have revelation, knowledge, um, you have the Jews, you have Israel, you have the millennial kingdom. Um, so here we have... Um, the angel that talked with him, Christ, is often described as being an angel in Scripture. And of course, the unique Son of God is worshipped by all the angels. That's the great mystery of things, the Father and the Son, friends. The angel that talked with him went forth, and another angel went forth to meet him. We see this, one of the features of Revelation is this... Uh, Interaction between Christ and the angels, we, we see that. It's a very precious thing to contemplate. And so we see that Christ Jesus, the word of God, 
uh, says to this angel, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. So we see the Son of God commanding an angel to give revelation to Ezekiel. Precious thing we read in Hebrews that the angels are ministers of God to minister salvation. Uh, to minister to those that are to inherit eternal life. It's a precious thing to think of, not something that's common in modern Christian thought. And ironically enough, I suppose the the the, uh, the Catholic doctrine of, of angels is ironically enough um, containing some elements of truth that perhaps uh, modern Protestantism doesn't contain. But we do see in Scripture. Uh, we see the angels presenting the prayers of man to God. That's a precious thing to think of. We see we, in the Gospels, we read that the little children, human children, have angels who see the face of God. Um, so, you know, um, there is only one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reality is that angels present the prayers of men. Angels protect human beings. Um, and we see here that angels can even give revelation knowledge. We see the Lord Jesus commanding this angel to run, to go to speak to Ezekiel and assure him of God's goodness, God's salvation, God's mercy and restoration of Jerusalem. Now, we know that this was a restoration, you know, certainly in the natural realm, that lasted um, another 570 years or so after this book was written, because we know that uh, when the Jewish people rejected Jehovah incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ, as was predestined and foreknown, um, we know that the Romans brutally besieged Jerusalem and slaughtered many thousands of Jews brutally, did terrible things to them after they'd been starved <clears throat> in Jerusalem, a besiegement that lasted two months. And then at that point, the Jews largely fled Israel and Israel ceased to be a nation um, until 1948 when Elohim Yavah threw the Lord Jesus. One moment, friend. Restored Israel as a nation um, through uh, mercy and benevolence and goodness through the influence uh, of his wife, the Lord Jesus was able to uh, bring about through the United Nations, through the Christianized nations, mercy and grace towards Yashirel, towards Israel, and Israel became a nation again in 1948. So whilst it's, it's uh, largely true that Israel was not a sovereign nation from the time of the Babylonish captivity, um, which, which was... Uh, uh, over 2,600 years ago now, uh, until 1948, Israel was still a nation until around AD 70, although it was under Roman rule. Um, so, yeah, Israel was still a country, it was still a nation until AD 70. So it, it wasn't a nation again for another 1,870 years until 1948, which is now 75 years ago, an entire generation, and we see the fig tree blossoming at the present time. We see Israel as a mighty economic and military nuclear power at the present time. Um, and the land brings forth great fruit and vegetables, which is actually a, a promise that, that is in the scripture, um, that Israel will, will supply fruit and vegetables to the world. And at the present time, it produces vast quantities of fruit and vegetables that are sold around the world. So we have an angelic giving, we have an angel, we have angelic revelation to mankind. A very precious thing to think of, friends. We would normally think of the Holy Spirit giving revelation knowledge, and of course that's not untrue, that's absolutely true. But here it's an angel that speaks directly with Ezekiel, commanded by the Son of God. It's a very precious thing that Ezekiel enters into the holy revelation 
uh, purposes of God. So God gives revelation to Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus gives revelation to an angel and commands the angel to give revelation to Ezekiel. Now this verse, I saith Jehovah, I will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Verse 5, precious, precious verse, friends. There's a, a beautiful hymn that I would play for you, um, and perhaps I will play a hymn on the, on, or two on the channel at some point, friends. I still need to do a little bit of modification to settings on Zoom. Um, but there's a lovely hymn, A Wall of Fire Around You, You've Nothing Now to Fear. With his manner, he your hungry souls shall fill. Then sweeping up in glory, you will see his blessed face. And rivers of delight will ever flow. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, and the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Very precious things, friends, and that's a lovely, a lovely old hymn. Um, I may well just record it individually, but there it is. That hymn is based on uh, Zechariah 2, verse 5. I will be to her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Very precious. And right there in, in the process of this revelation knowledge and, and, and the commands and the, the order of play, as it were, from God through the Lord Jesus to an angel, and then the angel is told to go to a human being to give this revelation. And then, boom, Jehovah himself there speaks in the midst of all this and says, I will be to her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Very, very precious friends to think of. And that's a promise to mankind, I would say. Uh, I would say it's a promise relating to the first woman, Eve, uh, took the knowledge of evil i would say it's a promise to to the the church to individual christians individual human beings and of course elohim yahovah is the very life inside every human being that's another mystery of things elohai which means the god of life elohai uh, is a divine title and of course uh, god is the glory the life inside every human being um, and of course, it has to be said, were it not for the uh, the mercy and provenient grace, the goodness of Elohim Yavah, no flesh would be saved. At this moment, uh, 8,000 million living humans are alive by grace. Every human being's next breath comes by goodness and grace and mercy. And through the finished work of Christ, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, Nobody on this planet lives or moves or breathes without the mercy and intercession of Christ. That's another mystery of things. And the truth. So you see, friends, we learn more of these things. We understand the preeminence of Christ Jesus. We understand the sovereignty of Christ Jesus unto the Son. Uh, all judgment is committed. Nobody knows the Son except the Father. Nobody knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son is pleased to make him known. So, very precious verse, and very precious, uh, I would say a very precious procedure in this chapter. And as I said, uh, Zechariah, uh, quite rarely amongst the prophets, uh, of course, there's been many thousands of prophets, um, but amongst the prophets who have books of scripture named after them, there is only uh, a few of them that were also priests. Zechariah is one of them. And I would say there is certainly a priestly character to this chapter in terms of the process. Uh, you know, we have the revelation uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ to Ezekiel. And what's in view is Christ's estimation, Christ's quantification, Christ's perspective. 
Christ has a measuring line in his hand. It's rather interesting um, that in Ezekiel, let me see, friends, if I can find it for you. The Lord Jesus, uh, it could be here, friends, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3. You can go and listen to that broadcast if you like. Behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a flax cord in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. That, of course, is the Lord Jesus. In Revelation 1 and Daniel 10, uh, we see uh, the Ancient of Days, whose appearance is like brass uh, and gold and brightness and shining, eyes like flames of fire, feet like burnished brass. Um, the bill of it, the Lord Jesus the Christ. If you read Song of Songs, friends, you can learn more about the personage of Christ Jesus. Uh, Christ Jesus is greater than the sum total of all flesh. The Son of God is greater than the full total of every human being that has or will ever walk this planet. Christ is greater in power, wisdom, stature and sovereignty than all flesh. Now, so there you have it. Um, so we, we see here um, that here it's a measuring line. The, the flax um, would speak of the power of Christ to restrain. And of course, Nobody took his life from him. Christ Jesus laid down his life voluntarily, for the purpose of eternal redemption to save all mankind. Um, but when it says he has a flax cord in his hand and a measuring reed, that's the preciousness of Christ in his concerns for mankind, his estimation of reality, and his willingness to enter into death in order to be able to restrain the doomed, deluded, vile, devile, and his wiles in order to bring about the heart, the counsels, and the purposes of Yahovah, his God, and his Father. But here in this uh, book of priestly character, he doesn't have um, a golden flax in his hand. He has a measuring line. As much as to say, those that are faithful, holy brethren of Christ Jesus, um, you know, the question of restraint is dealt with. They themselves are consecrated, holy vessels. Um, and so um, God neither needs to restrain them or restrain the devil from them because they are holy and righteous and pure and just and agreeable to Elohim Yavah. Um, so then it's a question of estimation, contemplation, reflection, and reality. And to, 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 to have estimation of God's purposes in Christ, of the Lamb's wife, the preciousness of the fact that God brings his son to himself and his son's wife, the church, the bride of Christ. And so, of course, we have here the command. Babylon was uh, was to the northeast of Israel. Uh, and, of course, to the north of Israel is lands like Turkey and uh, Syria and Lebanon. And uh, the Jews are commanded here to return back into the land of Israel. So this was after the captivity. Ho, ho, flee from the land of the north, says Yehovah. I have scattered you abroad as the four winds of the skies. Says Yahweh, escape Zion that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. So this is right after um, the wicked Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, was assassinated and Darius the Mede became king over Babylon. And then in verse 8, we have something very precious, friends. Thus says Yahweh, after the glory 
hath he sent me unto the nations that made you a spoil. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Now, this verse declares the deity of Christ Jesus. If you look closely, friends, at uh, Zechariah 2.8, it's on the screen. Uh, Thus says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. So this is the Lord of hosts speaking. After the glory, he has sent me to the nations. So God is the speaker and God is the one that is sent. Can you see that, friends? I hope it's not too technical for my listeners. I find it crystal clear. For thus says the Lord of armies, Jehovah of hosts, after the glory he has sent me to the nations. So this is a speaker, the word of truth, the word of God, the Lord Jesus, the Christ, who is God in his own person. Thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory, he has sent me to the nations that made you a spoil. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Very, very, very precious and pure revelation of the deity of Christ, the Godhood of Jesus, that Jesus is God. It's the great mystery of things unto the Son. The Father has said, thy throne, O God, endureth forever and forever. For a scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thine kingdom. For thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thine fellows. After the glory, so that speaking of Christ Jesus in ascension up to God his Father, um, it's most precious to contemplate that the eternal Son had knowledge of all this. Of course, what we're reading here, friends, um, is... Uh, 600 years before the atoning death and triumphal resurrection of the Christ God. But Christ here uh, gives revelation to Ezekiel uh, that he already knoweth that after the glory, he is, Christ himself will be sent back to earth to the nations that oppress the Jews. Because whoever oppresses the Jews touches the apple of God's eye. The right hand of Yahovah will find all his enemies. A wise king knows how to bring the wheel over his enemies. God has sent a strong delusion to those that receive not the love of the truth. Christ will appear to those that love his appearing. There are many professing believers on the earth today. And unto them the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ will be a day of doom and great gloomy darkness. They think they are right with God, but they are sinners. War to the sins that are at ease in Zion. No doubt there are many persons in the land of Israel, the natural, physical land of Israel at the present time, that would think they're right with Elohim Yavah because they're in the land of Israel. and The God of Israel will care for them, but they're in rejection of the Son. If any man hath not the Son, he hath not the Father either. There are no doubt many professing religionists, persons of uh, profession of Christ uh, in many different groups that do not have possession of Christ. They have not eaten his flesh or drank his blood. And don't have complete faith in the finished work of eternal redemption. Well, God knows the hearts. God is gracious, friends. God is merciful. There is forgiveness with Elohim, Yahweh, friends. So, some very precious things here, friends. We see 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory he sent me to the nations that made you a spoil. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. So divine purposes, divine sovereignty, divine wisdom, friends. God is king of nations, king of saints. All mortal humans are as grasshoppers. The wicked, his sword. Not a single human being on this planet moves without Elohim, Yahovah. All things live through, for, with, and serve the Son of God. All, all things on this planet are sustained by the very breath of the lips of Jesus. And everything that is in subject will be destroyed. Only the elect, those whom Yahweh Elohim has chosen to sanctification in the truth, those that are foreknown, those that are predestined, those that are called, those that are justified, those that are sanctified, those that are glorified. The Lamb's wife. Elohim Yahweh began everything with one man. And everything everywhere in the whole universe will be completed with one man. Yes, it has to be said that um, it's most remarkable that there are human beings that deny the deity of Christ. <clears throat> it really, really is. And uh, to think of delusion, to think of how human beings and entire collectives of human beings uh, are in denial of the deity of Christ. I listened to... Uh, uh, probably only 10 minutes of a discourse, a public discourse between what you might call an evangelical Christian and a Jehovah's Witness. And both of them are prominent men in, in those, shall we say, movements for the purpose of converse and brevity uh, yesterday. And um, maybe 15 minutes. But anyway, um, the evangelical Christian's presentation was, was reasonable. Um, uh, and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses' was, uh, discourse was was twisted, he, he, and he began his very entry point. And the, the topic of discourse, friends, was the deity of Christ, that Christ is divine, that Christ is God. And, of course, the official Jehovah's Witness doctrine is that that's not the case, that Jesus is a God, not the God. Uh, and they've got their own copy of the scriptures that that, uh, that is twisted to 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 try to make that point. And that's their official doctrine. You see. Um, anyway, um, when the uh, I listened to about uh, to twelve minutes, perhaps of the uh, the, the former uh, the Bible believing Christian give his presentation, it was reasonable, and then the Jehovah's Witness spoke, and straight away. Uh, his resting of scripture, his uh, perversion, his, his distraction, his premise was that we ought to open our minds to consider that it's possible that there is another God, which is completely preposterous. You know, I, it was so obvious that, that this, uh, this man who was attempting to deny the deity of Christ, the Godhood of Christ, uh, you know, his manner and his speech showed forth his wickedness straight away within 15 seconds of him opening his mouth. And that's correctly in line with Proverbs, friends. You can, I've said this often on the channel, I don't mind repeating myself. Friends, if you want to know about the mystery of iniquity, the principle of reprobation is crystal clear in the book of Proverbs. Those that are deceived already are much more likely to continue being deceived. Uh, and those that speak lies are much more likely to listen to further lies. It's a principle of reprobation. It's the opposite of true Christianity, friends. It's the opposite of divine revelation. Uh, it's the opposite of everything working together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to purpose, to 
uh, to the blessings and the goodnesses and the promises of Elohim Yavar to the holy faithful disciples of Christ Jesus. It's the opposite of that. Proverbs makes it crystal clear that liars become fools. So there's coming a time of full, entire, and complete revelation, friends. The last chapter of the glorious book of Daniel, we've got 29 podcasts covering all 12 chapters on this channel, um, tells us that the righteous, the wise, will understand, but the wicked will not understand. So, so those that are not subject, those that are not holy, those that are not faithful, those that are not righteous, righteous in their lifestyles and works as well, um, those persons uh, are deceived and they are deceived deceivers uh, and they continue in deception and they're open to further deception. So, anyway, this chap, uh, I suppose that's what I wanted to say, this chap, this Jehovah's Witness, within within a number of seconds of beginning to speak, his premise, uh, no doubt he didn't realise how preposterous his premise was, uh, his preposterous proposition to, to Bible-believing Christians was that they need to open their mind to the possibility that there is another God. <laughs> you know? um, laughable uh, hypocrisy, wretchedness and delusion. Uh, but at the same time, most, most solemnly instructive for the faithful to contemplate uh, and to be vigilant, you see, because fear of man brings a snare. Such a person should not be given a hearing by Bible-believing Christians, friends. You need to be very careful what you listen to. You need to be very careful what you think about and what you listen to. As soon as I heard him say those words, friends, I probably listened to another 15, 20 seconds and switched it off because I'd heard enough. That was it. If someone's uh, entry point of discourse is delusion uh, and lies and falsehood, then that's that, you know. How can two walk together except they be agreed, you know? Um, so there we have it. Anyway, to come back to today's portion of the sacred page, um, Zechariah 2, there you have it, crystal clean, verse 8. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, after the glory, he has sent me to the nations. So the speaker is Jehovah of hosts, and it's Jehovah of hosts that is sent by Jehovah of hosts. And this is a feature uh, that eventually we'll look at more closely on the channel. Um, that is to say, the deity of Christ, the Father and the Son, uh, and the mystery uh, of incarnate deity, that there is a human being that's 100% God, and 100% man. And of course, in this chapter, it's the pre-incarnate deity of Christ. And I suppose with human speech, um, term terminologies, and choices of words are not always the best for the purpose of brevity, friends. I could I could be talking on this podcast until mid for another 12 hours. Um, whether anyone would listen to it remains to be seen. But um, but at any rate, what I wanted to say is um, um, Christ is a, is a term in relation to incarnate deity. Um, so I don't think it's untrue to say that we're reading here a, a pre-incarnate Christ speaking. But technically, I suppose, what we're talking about is the pre-incarnate, the Son, the eternal Son of God. That's the speaker here. Thus says Yahweh, about after the glory, he sent me to the nations. See? But the, 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 the mystery is that the pre-incarnate son knew uh, about physical incarnation. See, Because what's in view there is the physical return of Christ Jesus with millions of his holy ones to begin the thousand-year millennial physical kingdom uh, from Jerusalem, Israel, when all nations, all mortals, all humanity will be entirely and completely subjugated to the Son of God. Which thing is imminent? So a verse like that 
well, perhaps the reason why persons don't see those things is because they don't have the Holy Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, you see. And blessed art thou, Simon, bar John of flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in the skies, in the heavens. Um, so the preciousness of revelation, knowledge of the deity of Christ to Simon um, was very wonderful. And of course, Elohim Yavah is wonderful and gracious and faithful and righteous and just. Elohim Yahweh is very, very great. So we see here the preciousness of the Jewish nation. Um, and of course, at this time, as I've already intimated, this period of time here, um, 2,600 years ago almost, uh, was the cessation of the Babylonish captivity, which was the cessation of Babylon. Babylon itself was fallen, was fallen at that time. Um, we, we did an entire series of, I believe it was 83 podcasts on the entire book of Jeremiah. And chapters 46 through 51 of that wonderful book uh, is God's dealings with the nations that God had used to punish Israel. Um, chapters 50 and 51 deal with God's wrath and sovereign dealings against Babylon. Um, and so here we see that the Jews are commanded to leave Babylon and return to Israel. Um, and the promise is that the nations that spoiled Jerusalem, God was going to spoil them. Um, and that had fulfillment at that time and at a near future time from now. You yeah, see. So, So God says, I will shake my hand upon them. It's a precious thing to think of the hand of Jehovah, friends, the hand of God. It's difficult for mortals to comprehend the greatness of Yahweh Elohim, I would say. To think of the, the arm of Yahovah, the hand of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The heart of the Lord, the feet of the Lord, the place of my feet is glorious. My resting place is glorious the house of Yahweh, the throne of Yahweh Elohim, the door of the house of Yahweh, the charge of the altar of Yahweh, the charge of the house of Yahweh, the inner sanctuary of the house of Yahweh. These are all precious things that can be helpful to Christians to begin to understand the deeper things of God. God says, I will shake my hand upon them. There's another verse. Friends, that um, it, it says, it intimates that God's dealings with all mankind is just like when a man turns the bowl over. And um, I, I do all the washing up here. And uh, when I do the washing up, I occasionally contemplate this verse that the, the Creator, the Elohim Yahweh's dealings with all mankind is just like when a man turns a dish over. Just like that. That's the power, the sovereignty of Yahweh, friends. Just like that. So God says, I'll shake my hand on them. They'll become a spoil to those that serve them. So all nations will serve the Jews. All nations will serve the Yahudim, the Yashulites. Every human being that's ever or will ever walk this planet will be subject to a man that died for them through whom they enjoyed their entire lives and to whom they owe glory, thanksgiving and praise forevermore. Christ has brought to light life and immortality through the finished work of eternal redemption. And of course, verse 9 is also um, the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of an only begotten son, the father in truth and love. Um, verse nine, if you, it follows on. Um, well, that's the revelation of this chapter is the Lord Jesus Christ, Zechariah 2. Ezekiel sees the man with a measuring line. 
the estimation of Christ, all judgment is committed to the Son. And the Son is measuring Jerusalem, which is a description of the Lamb's wife, the redeemed. To quantify and see the value and preciousness of the bride, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might redeem her, sanctify her with washing of the water of the word. He presented to himself a living, glorious assembly, having neither spot, wrinkle or blemish. The purity of Christ, the greatness of Christ, the motives, the purposes of Christ, the sinless Son of God, presenting his wife to himself, a living, glorious assembly, without spot, wrinkle or blemish. So we see here the sovereignty of Christ giving instructions of revelation knowledge to an angel that comes to Ezekiel to declare the truth to Ezekiel of redemption and mercy and goodness. And then you have the sovereignty of Yahweh, the sovereignty of God in preservation and being the glory in the midst of mankind. Jesus said, I have given them the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. So that's covenant relationship. Um, very precious thing to think of the glory that Christ had with the Father as he given to true disciples. Well, that would be the glory of covenant relationship, of knowing God as Father, uh, knowing Christ as Saviour, knowing the power of the Holy Ghost as revelation. Uh, the kingdom of God is not in food and drink, but in righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, the Elohim Yavar says, I'll be the glory in the midst of her, and I'll be like a wall of fire round about. Very precious, we read of Moses, where there was a pillar of fire by night, showing sovereign power protecting the Jews, and uh, a cloud of glory by day. How precious, friends, to contemplate these things. Um, and then, so all, all this is uh, is the words of Jesus, you see. Very precious thing to think of. Of course, Christ is every man, woman, and child upon the orb. All judgment is committed to the Son. So Christ says, thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory he sent me to the nations, that made you a spoil, he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon him, that nail-pierced hand. Christ will shake his hand upon them and they'll become servants to those that served them. You know, friends, we read in Isaiah that Yahovah Elohim, God, turned the world upside down. In the book of Acts, deluded mortals accused the disciples of Jesus Christ of turning the world upside down. But as is the case with deluded mortals, the complete opposite of what they think is often the truth. So the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ turn the world the right way up. Um, and that's why we have the Bible, uh, the most prolific and best-selling book the planet's ever seen. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ is the best-known name on the planet. Christianity is the best-known belief system. Almost all humans on the planet, their date of birth is dated from the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all these things is the sovereignty of God. The preeminence of Christ. Oh, yes. So we also, friends, know that uh, everything from the welfare state, uh, which is a very, very important thing in Britain, the welfare state, Provides everything from pensions to older persons to unemployment benefit to disability benefit to housing benefit. Um, the social services system, very, very important system. The sewage system, clean running water, the judiciary, the police, the ambulance service, the fire service, the clean streets. Everything is as a result of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything good on this planet is as a result of the Son of God. Everything. The victory in both the wars, everything is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And one day, all humanity will see this. So how deluded and wicked those Jews were that, that accused the disciples of turning the world upside down. They truly turned the world the right way up, the righteous acts of the saints. So this matter of the sinful nature, friends, of the influence of the doomed, deluded, vile, devile, remember the first man born of a woman on this planet was a murderer. He murdered the second man born, Cain, murdered his brother, Abel. That's the solemnity of things. Christ shakes his nail-pierced hand upon them, and they become a spoil to the Jews. And they will know that the Lord of hosts has sent the Messiah, Jesus. Sing aloud and rejoice, daughter of Zion, for behold, I cometh, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, says Yahweh. Very, very precious to think that the eternal Son of God is the life inside every human being. Many nations shall join themselves to Yahovah in that day and shall be unto me for peoples. I will dwell in the midst of thee and you shall all know that Yahovah Sabaoth has sent me unto thee. What a precious verse, friend. Zechariah 2, 1, 1. Many nations shall join themselves to Yahovah in that day and shall be unto me for a peoples. And I will dwell in the midst of thee and you shall know that Yahweh Sabaoth has sent me unto thee. 2.1.2 Yahweh shall inherit Yahudah. Yahweh shall inherit Yahweh as his portion in the Kadosh Eretz, the Holy Land, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. What a precious verse. Yahweh shall inherit Yahudah as his portion in the Kadosh Eretz and shall yet choose Yerushalayim. Let all flesh be silent before Yahovah, for he is risen up out of his holy habitation. That's Zechariah 2.1.3. So this chapter, friends, I could talk for hours on this chapter. It's the revelation of the Son of God as Jehovah in triune expression. It's a holy mystery. The Son in resurrection power, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in full expression commands mankind to be silent before the Lord. For he is risen up out of his holy habitation. It's a divine mystery. We read in Revelation, there shall be silence in heaven for an hour. This theme of being silent before the Lord is quite a rare theme in scripture. Um, yes. Yeah, so there's 35 results for the word silence in Scripture. Psalm 83, O God, keep not silence, hold not your peace, be not still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee lift up the head. They take crafty counsel against your people and consult against your hidden ones. He keeps the feet of his saints, but the wicked are silenced in darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For by strength shall no man prevail. Not a hand or a foot moves on this planet without Jehovah Elohim, friends. Make no mistake about it. Jehovah Elohim is entirely sovereign on this planet, friends. There's only one king on this planet. Jehovah Elohim, friends. Not mortals, not devils. And to me they listened and waited and kept silence for my counsel. Job 2.9.2.1 2, 
Job 3, 1, 3, 4, because I feared the great multitude and the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence and went not out of the door. Unto thee, Avada, do I call, Psalm 2, 8, 1, be not silent to me. Blessed if you keep silence towards me, I become like those that go down into the pit. Very precious to contemplate the, the voice of the Lord. You are now clean through the word I have speak, spoken unto you. And as such were some of you, but now are you washed, now are you sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You're very important, friends, to stay in the scriptures, you know, and to be vigilant. It's very easy to become bedeviled and deluded. And so you can go on to the wonderful BibleGateway.com yourselves, friends, and Put in any word like I've just done on the screen there and it will give you instantly the results. But the verse I wanted us to look at, uh, we'll just look at a couple more. Psalm 8, 3, 1, oh God, keep not silence, hold not your peace, be not still, oh God. Ecclesiastes 3, 7, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A trio of mentions of the word silence in Isaiah, Yeshio. Isaiah 411. Keep silence before me, islands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us draw near together to judgment. And then Isaiah 656. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. And a trio of references in silence uh, in Amos 8. Sorry, a trio of mentions in Amos, the last one in um, Amos 8. So this is the verse I wanted us to look at, friends. Revelation 8, 1 says, He opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in the heaven about half an hour. Well, if you go with literal interpretation of Scripture, a day with Adonai Yahavah is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Well, if you work that out, friends, uh, perhaps you're listening to this, perhaps you're a person that's, if you have to be 42 years old, uh, that works out uh, about an hour. If a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, you get your calculator out, that means about 42 years, about an hour. So maybe you're listening to this and you're a man or a woman that's 63, that would be about an hour and a half. So about 21 years, 21 earth years, would be about half an hour if you was to take that uh, perception. So there's silence in heaven for 21 years. Um, so whatever it means to be silent for half an hour is a long time, even in earthly perspective. For a man or a woman to sit in complete silence for half an hour is quite a while. And we see that this precedes the seven trumpets that the seven angels have. Yes. Yes, the great thing to be in the scriptures, beloved, here can us. Yes, let all flesh be silent before Yahovah, for he is risen up out of his holy habitation. The, the theme of God rising up, we read, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Um, the Holy One of Israel rises up out of his place. 
the right hand of Yahweh will find all his enemies. Precious thing to think of Christ as being the right hand of God. We know that uh, all the enemies of the Lord Jesus will be destroyed by the breath of his lips. So what's in view there, given the reality that Jehovah is every man, woman and child upon this orb, is the sovereignty of God through human flesh. And one of the interesting features of the imminent thousand year physical reign in the millennial kingdom of Christ Jesus upon this earth is that there will be human beings upon the earth that do not have physical immortality. Quite a thing to think of. So you, you will have uh, Bible-believing Christians uh, that have physical immortality that will be ruling the planet for a thousand earth years in the imminent future. But you also have human beings upon the earth that do not have physical immortality that will die what we currently term as a natural death. You read about that in Isaiah uh, 66, and it says the sinner dying 100 years old will be called a curse. So we will see that there will be the unsaved will even live decades longer. Such is the effects of the glory and the goodness and the benevolence of Elohim Yavar, that sinners will even live longer during the millennial kingdom. It's very important to know that all the saints will have physical immortality at that point. Let all flesh be silent before Yahweh, for he is risen up out of his holy habitation. Well, we'll be back soon with another broadcast. I appreciate you tuning in, friends. Do feel free to like, comment, share and subscribe to the channel. Um, we'll be back soon with the third chapter of this glorious book. Uh, so until then, grace and peace and mercy from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Shalom, shalom, Baruch Hashem, Adonai, Yehovah, Elohayim, blessed is he that cometh. In the name of Adonai, Yehovah, Elohayim.